All right, well, welcome to another edition of From the Woods today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm an information specialist in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And uh, my co-host, Billy Thomas, is on vacation this week, but so filling in with him is Dr. Ellen Crocker, and I greatly appreciate her being here. And if you've watched any of our shows, you're no stranger to Ellen. Um, she is a forest health specialist in our department, and uh, Ellen, I really thank you for being a part of our show today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, filling in for Billy is, is a big ask. It's hard to fill his shoes, but I it hope is. he's having fun on the beach today, uh, enjoying, enjoying his vacation. So uh, thanks for having me and excited to be here. Sure. So today we've got a wonderful show for you all. Um, it's on tree threats. And with Ellen being a forest health specialist, she is the one that knows a lot about those. And I think she's going to give us several different things about tree threats, um, what's out there. And also we have our tree of the week, a chestnut oak. And we've got a special little uh, number for you at the very end. So make sure you stick around so that uh, you can learn what that is. But right now, I think we're going to go ahead and start um, Ellen's presentation with three tree threats. So um, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground today. Uh, so I hope everyone will bear with me as we talk about some of the things that um, can hurt trees and um, the breadth of what that looks like. So I don't know about you all, but um, this year, especially with everything happening, um, you know, folks being uh, stuck at home more than they normally would, I've received a lot of questions uh, that go something like, uh, what's wrong with my tree? And, um, you know, there are a lot of different potential issues out there. And they range from kind of things that might be really noticeable, uh, but not major issues for the health of th things, um, to things that have the potential to kill trees and uh, cause long-term problems. So I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about uh, those differences in kind of uh, spanning the gap, kind of scratching the surface of uh, when something's wrong with your tree, what might it be? Um, so uh, kind of common problems for trees, right off the bat, I want to uh, mention something and that's that we've got trees that we're talking about today in these two really different contexts. We have trees that are kind of in a landscape setting. Maybe they're growing in your yard or in a park or maybe they're street trees. And then we have trees that are growing in the woods. Now as a forest health specialist, most of what I look at are those trees in the woods. Um, here at University of Kentucky, we have some great specialists who focus more on trees in the landscape setting, people like uh, Dr. Bill Fountain. Um, but in both of these scenarios, you get some overlaps and some really common problems. Uh, that's because a lot of the same stressors, a lot of the same insects and diseases and issues affect them. Um, but you've got some unique issues in those two different settings as well. So when you're talking about trees in the landscape setting, um, on the one hand, uh, they tend to be a lot more stressed than trees growing in the woods. You know, uh, they were planted there. They might not be perfectly suited to those sites. On the other hand, you've got a lot of potential to do something about that. Um, so if there's a drought, you can water your trees, um, which is not necessarily an option for those trees in the woods. So I just wanted to throw that out there on the front end and that today I'm kind of mixing these two. I'm talking about trees in both of those settings. Um, but really, you're gonna wanna look at those two different issues a little bit separately. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but uh, also some key differences that I'm going to gloss over today, just in the interest of time and kind of giving us a good introduction, uh, but just something to keep in mind. So what are some common problems that I see for trees? Uh, so when people send me a help, what's, one, what's wrong with my tree email? What are some common trends? Uh, one of the things is that those trees were off on the wrong foot to begin with. So this might have been poor planting, very common in, in landscape areas. So here's a tree from campus. And uh, what you probably can't tell around it is that all of the trees that were planted in this one planting were planted way too deep. And they all had to be excavated by hand because something that a lot of people I think don't realize is that tree roots need to breathe. And if they don't have that ability, if they're planted too deep, um, they'll do very weird things like spiraling around the trunk of the tree, uh, you know, maybe forming really dense mats of roots that will eventually suffocate that tree over time and cut off its circulation. Um, and in urban areas especially, we see that a lot, is that the tree, you know, right from the beginning just was not set up for success based on how it was planted. 
Another common issue is that you've got the wrong tree for the site. Now this can come in a variety of different flavors. You know, this picture I'm showing here is maybe an extreme example of, uh, you know, large shade trees that unfortunately are right underneath power lines. And maybe they were growing there to begin with and then the power lines were installed. Um, but definitely not something you'd want to do is to plant a tree uh, right off the bat, you know there's going to be some problems because it won't be able to grow into its full form. The same thing can happen if it doesn't have enough rooting space. So you plant a tree that is going to be huge in kind of a tiny little area, it's never going to thrive and it's not going to um, reach its full potential. Um, similarly though, in woodland settings or maybe in plantation settings, you can see the same types of things if you've got a tree that's not adapted to that size. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of um, white pine or uh, walnut in a place that they don't want to be growing. Um, you're kind of setting yourself up for some problems down the road. If you've got a tree that's not adapted to that site, that doesn't like the, the moisture, that doesn't like the pH, that can't grow into the form it wants to be. Other common problem that I see for trees are something that I'd call general wear and tear. Uh, so these are things like damage from mowers and equipment, um, whether it's kind of in a, in a landscape setting like this picture here, or in the woods, uh, if you had a logging operation, you had a lot of soil compaction and equipment through there, dinging trees. Um, in this picture, I like it because it shows this tree um, that's, that's clearly declining. And the reason I say that is if you look up at the tips, um, they're bare, they don't have leaves on them. To me, that's a sign that there's this stress that's been building up year after year, and that tree is kind of shrinking in on itself little by little. Um, you know, has some significant issues. And you might see that from a distance and be like, oh, there's something wrong. But to see the problem, you've got to look up close. And that is that all around the base of the tree, where the kind of um, the trunk flares and, and you get those roots, um, there's mower damage all along there. So there's probably root rot fungi in there that are causing decay, that are causing problems for the tree. And something as small as that mower damage um, can really set trees up for failure in the long term. Another common issue might be poor pruning. So these are some extreme examples of topping. Uh, topping is a bad practice for trees. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, knowing a little bit about how trees work and what's going to help them heal and help them recover and set them up for um, a long, uh, healthy life in the future um, goes a long way. So all of this kind of comes to a point that I really want to make that stress trees equal avoidable problems. So I recently saw this quote from Dr. Bill Fountain that said 90% of plant samples submitted to the Plant Disease and Diagnostic Lab here in Kentucky have problems that can be traced back to cultural and soil problems. And of course, this is all plants, not just trees, but I think it's especially important for trees and that a lot of the kind of eye-catching issues or maybe striking uh, decline problems uh, their, their root problem, no pun intended, their root problem is that uh, they weren't set up for success to begin with. There's some uh, major site issue or uh, maybe how they were cared for that's led them into this downward spiral. So you can do yourself a lot of favors um, by promoting the health of these trees. It won't save you from everything, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but it will certainly help protect those trees from kind of native issues, minor issues, that they should be able to defend themselves against. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, that's not always the case. And that's where we enter into the common problems I like to uh, uh, group under, oh no. Um, so things that, uh, you know, through no fault of yours or anyone else's um, can really, really negatively impact the health of trees. So in our area, invasive threats, Insects and diseases are a huge issue. Um, and these are big problems because they can uh, kill perfectly healthy trees. I'm gonna talk about a few of those uh, for the remainder of this uh, presentation. Uh, but kind of across the state, across the country, across the world, uh, invasive tree issues are increasing and uh, causing a lot of tree deaths and are something that we're gonna have to continue dealing with going forward. 
um, but they're not the only ones. You know, here in this area, we get occasional ice storms and we get major droughts like we did last summer that are all just kind of things that we're gonna have to deal with going forward. And, um, you know, they're kind of unpredictable and they can seriously impact the health of trees. So let's talk about those invasive um, threats uh, for a minute. So the one that is kind of most visible, most problematic here in Kentucky right now is the emerald ash borer. You're probably familiar with this invasive beetle from Asia. Um, you can see it in that picture. It's kind of pretty if you like insects, um, the emerald green. But the larvae that it lays, and you can see a, a photo of that, um, tunnel just under the tree's bark, right in the vascular system of trees. And they can affect all of our ash trees as well as white fringe tree. And uh, that tunneling basically cuts off the circulation of the tree and will kill them uh, pretty rapidly. And it's been causing the death of millions of trees here in our state. So what are some signs of the emerald ash borer, EAB for short? Um, the first things you might notice would be dead branches, maybe a thinning crown. Um, that's a sign that you've got that, that uh, beetle larvae tunneling under the bark. Um, other signs of that you might see that uh, you have these D-shaped exit holes. That's where the adult beetles, after their larvae, chew their way out. Um, and then if you were to flake off the bark or it falls off on its own, you'd see these really squiggly tunnels, these serpentine tunneling. Um, that's caused by those emerald ash borer larvae. Um, and you can just see from that picture how much damage that's doing to the tree. Um, so it's no wonder that, that the emerald ash borer causes widespread death. Another really common uh, sign of this, kind of a little further down the road, this is where we are in a lot of our state, is you might see trees with their bark all falling off or maybe bark being flaked off. In this case, by woodpeckers that are trying to get at those larvae that are all through it. Um, in a lot of parts of the state, you know, it's not a, not a question of, uh, do you think you have emerald ash borer? It's a question of uh, how, how dead are your trees and how many trees you had because a lot of this has happened uh, for a long time. So here's where we are uh, in terms of emerald ash borer in Kentucky. So you can see it's already um, spread through the state. Um, it reached Kentucky in 2009, or at least that's when we had our first positive. And since that time, um, that was in northern Kentucky, uh, and it's moved through uh, the state and it's just starting to enter much of western Kentucky. Uh, so another way to kind of show this information would be looking at, uh, this is a map of um, not where emerald ash borer is, but where it's causing death of ash trees. Um, so all of those counties that have that red color, um, ash mortality is really common. So it's been there for a while and those trees are dead um, or they're well on their way. Whereas those areas that are in yellow, uh, maybe it's ash uh, mortality and decline is around, um, but you still also have some trees that are healthy. And in the area that doesn't have any color, that gray area, um, emerald ash borer is not there yet. So we don't have ash decline, but we do expect to see it in the future. This is a map that was produced by Kentucky Division of Forestry, um, and they do aerial flying um, of the state to try to get a grasp of you know, how bad is this damage and where is it? Um, but here in this map in the lower uh, right, you can see you know, where is the ash distribution in the state. And while much of the state, much of the ash was here in the northern part and those trees are dead, um, there's still some big pockets down here in the southern region that are yet to be hit. So what do you do now? Um, the most important part is laying the foundation for success post-emerald ash borer, whether that's in the landscape setting or in the woodland setting. What you want to see is um, other great trees taking the place of emerald ash borer. Um, in our woodlands especially, we want to see those many, many other native species that we have, not invasive species taking their place. In addition, hazard trees are a major and serious concern, uh, so something to think about. Um, emerald ash borer is not the only invasive. We have hemlock woolly adelgid. Here are some photos of it here. Um, it's attacking hemlock trees. And you can see, you know, it's throughout Kentucky. All of this red area is uh, impacted by the hemlock woolly adelgid that is unfortunately killing our hemlock trees. There are many other invasive tree threats here and on the horizon. Uh, so I've got a photo of sudden oak death and uh, Asian longhorn beetle, which we don't have in Kentucky, but we've had reports of introductions nearby. And here in this photo, you can see our newest invasive arrival. This is laurel wilt disease of sassafras that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. But I guess I wanna go back to this point that 
yes, insects and pathogens can cause problems, but most cause minor damage. Many can kill stress trees, but relatively few things can attack and kill healthy trees. Uh, so diagnosing tree problems is really tough. Site and its history are key, and sometimes you don't know that. It can be hard to pinpoint any one factor when what you have is a complex of stresses that are adding up over time. And sometimes even when the cause of problems is clear, there might not be as many management options as you want, especially if you're talking about things like root rot diseases. So let's talk about resources to help. Um, you know, Billy Thomas last time did a great job talking about this, but uh, the Cooperative Extension System and county agents across the state are amazing resources for helping. And uh, they also have access to the plant diagnostic lab. So if there's a question about a sample, they can submit that there, um, as well as consult with other specialists, other partners. Um, and then Kentucky Division of Forestry is a really great resource. And uh, next up, I'm gonna talk with Alexandra Blevins, who's the forest health specialist with Kentucky Division of Forestry, a little bit about her work and how it might relate to what you're doing. Um, and then there's lots of other great resources here to help, whether it's NRCS or professionals that you can hire, such as arborists or foresters. So um, let me turn this over to my interview with Alexandra. So I've got with me today a special guest. This is Alexandra Blevins, and she's the Forest Health Specialist with Kentucky Division of Forestry. Thanks so much for joining us today, Alexandra. Thank you for having me, Ellen. I appreciate it. So I know you're in the field today, so uh, you're going to show us a few things from the field, hopefully, as long as there's signal. Um, but I wanted to talk with you a little bit before that about the work that you've been doing this summer with a new invasive uh, pest that's killing trees in Kentucky. Um, so this is something that we just unfortunately found out that we had. Um, and now you're trying to kind of put together the pieces of that puzzle of where it is and um, you know what we can be doing about it. Uh, so would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yes, Ellen, um, it'd be my pleasure. So this uh, new disease complex that Ellen is talking about is laurel wilt disease. And it was actually first discovered in the United States down in Georgia in the coastal plains back in 2002. And ever since then, this disease has been creeping its way um, outside of the coastal plains region and moving its way uh, northward. And as Ellen mentioned, we have just found this disease here in the state of Kentucky uh, just last summer in July of 2019 down in the southwest portion of our state. And so, you know, we might be jumping the gun here. What is laurel wilt disease? So let me tell you a little bit about this disease complex. So um, I mentioned it was an insect and fungal disease complex. So what we're dealing with here is an invasive insect. It's an Asiatic species called the red bay ambrosia beetle. And so this is a type of ambrosia beetle, which is a fungal farmer. So these beetles uh, will have these little pits and they carry spores of fungus around with them. And when they go to bore into trees, they are actually inoculating these trees with these fungal spores. So this tiny little beetle, it's only about a 16th of an inch or smaller, little tiny brown beetle, you probably wouldn't even notice it flying past your face. Um, these beetles are not the lethal part of the disease, it's what they're carrying that is the lethal part to these trees. So um, it is carrying um, the laurel wilt fungus or Raphael lauricola, if you want the fancy term. Um, and so this fungal pathogen is what is actually, you know, culling out these trees. And so how is it doing that? So you have, all it takes is one female beetle to bore into a tree and inoculate the tree with this fungus. And then the fungus will start to do its work inside of the tree. And so as this fungus grows, it is actually um, kind of, uh, blocking off the transport of water and nutrients, um, you know, through the tree, which will eventually uh, cause the tree to wilt and rapidly die. Our major concerns are sassafras and spice bush. Thus far, we've only had uh, records of effects to sassafras, but we also are monitoring the spice bush um, in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, we've been working really closely with our uh, neighboring state of Tennessee 
Um, they have also documented several counties uh, that are positive for laurel wilt disease. Um, and most recently, they had a county in the uh, northeastern part of the state, Hamlin County. Um, and so this kind of threw us for a ringer. Um, so now, uh, KDF, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, we are uh, expanding our survey work into the eastern part of the state as well. So here you can see some photos of uh, the symptoms of laurel wilt on sassafras. Uh, as Alexandra was mentioning, you can see some wilt. Um, also, what's really striking is it looks like early fall leaf color. So the leaves turn kind of bright orange and uh, red and uh, will then fall off and um, you're left with kind of these uh, uh, spindly uh, bare shoots. Um, and if you do see this and then you cut into the bark of the tree, um, what you'll notice, it's really striking about laurel wilt, is this dark black staining just um, under the bark when you cut through. And that's very distinctive, and that's something that's um, somewhat unique to laurel wilt and is a sign of that fungus in the tree cutting off its circulation, as well as the tree's response to that, which together really um, effectively strangle that tree. I think a lot of people tell me, well, sassafras isn't that important. There's not that much sassafras, so why should we care? And I think it's just another example of how quickly and how easily these invasive species can come in and wipe out a species of tree. Um, and sassafras is a great tree for a lot of reasons, even if it's not a major timber species. Uh, so I sure hate to uh, see this happening. And hopefully we'll be able to spread the word about that and encourage people to um, not move it around any faster than it's going to move naturally. As I think that's one of the big risks, right, is people maybe accidentally moving uh, contaminated um, material from, from one place to another. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, the human assisted moves, uh, whether it be through firewood or other type of woody materials, um, it's a huge problem that we are combating, um, not only here in the state of Kentucky, but, you know, everywhere else in the country. Um, and so, yes, that is something to definitely keep in mind, um, you know, burn locally and, uh, you know, moving around other types of woody material, you have to be very hesitant about that. So last week, Billy Thomas talked about resources that are available to landowners. And of course, the Kentucky Division of Forestry is a fantastic resource uh, for a lot of different reasons. And you're here representing specifically the forest health side of things. So there's a lot of different ways that, you know, that can be of benefit to our viewers and to the people watching. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about kind of the work that you do and, um, you know, if someone has a question, how they could reach out to you about that um, and uh, engage with you and other folks from Kentucky Division of Forestry? Yes, of course. So I have actually been with the Kentucky Division of Forestry ever since uh, 2017. I actually got started in the forest health program treating hemlock trees out in uh, eastern Kentucky for the hemlock woolly adelgid. And um, ever since then, I've just been in this new forest health specialist position uh, just a little over a year. So um, I, I'm dealing with uh, a lot of issues. Um, a lot of people say that forest health is kind of a doom and gloom uh, perspective on things, um, but there is a little bit of light every once in a while at the end of the tunnel. Um, and so, you know, we uh, do a lot of landowner technical assists. So whether you're having an issue with one tree in your yard or you have a whole wood lot that's got something, some sort of issue going on, uh, just give us a call and we'll come out and check out that uh, issue for you. And so, you know, we get calls ranging from, um, you know, pine decline to uh, frost damage, all different kinds of things. And uh, specifically for the realm of forest health, we have uh, what I like to call our heavy hitters, so to speak. Um, so, you know, we have our invasives, whether they're insects or plant species, um, that are a constant battle that we're trying to fight here in the state of Kentucky and everywhere else in the country. And um, also, you know, these new diseases such as laurel wilt that um, pop up and we, you know, have to implement 
uh, uh, surveying and monitoring plans and uh, track them throughout the state. And so, um, you know, every day is something new. Um, it's, it could be, you know, honeysuckle removal one day and then going to treat hemlocks another day and then uh, going to collect insect traps uh, for lure wilt the next. So uh, lots of different things on the, on the table when it comes to forest health. So speaking of collecting insect traps, we've got a video of, of an UK forestry and natural resources undergraduate student, Daniel Root, who has been an intern with both of our groups this summer. Um, so he's been working uh, with you and the KDF Forest Health uh, Program, uh, doing all sorts of different things. So hopefully a good experience for him. And it's been great working with him as well. Um, uh, so let's let's check that out. Hi, I'm Daniel Root. I'm an intern with the UK Forest Health. Uh, we're out here today uh, checking the traps that we have for our Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle, which is a vector for our laurel wilt disease for our sassafras and spice bush. So first we're going to go ahead and, and create a, we've got a sift here. We basically write uh, the location, the, the date, and our trap number. And we're going to basically sift it through here to collect all the, the uh, insects that we've collected in there and we're going to reset it hope that we find some traces of it we basically refill it where we just use everyday common glycopropylene or antifreeze this is one of two traps that we have out here this is a panel we also have a funnel uh, this, this basically replicates a trunk and there's little bit of a, a bait here that they use to draw in the, the red bait uh, beetle and then they get in here and they fall down into the antifreeze. Uh, so I just wanted to thank uh, Alexandra and uh, thank Daniel for uh, doing that. Um, you know, it's been great working with Daniel. Always great to have an undergraduate student here in the UK Department of Forestry uh, work with us. Um, so uh, I know that um, uh, Alexandra is joining us from the field. And uh, if you all have questions about tree health or other issues, um, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, again, if anyone has any questions at all, make sure you type them in the chat pod um, on any kind of tree health uh, issue at, at all. And uh, Ellen will be able to answer those along with Alexandria. And um, Ellen, one thing I noticed at the beginning of your presentation, I saw some of the roots on the tree was kind of wrapped around it at the bottom. And I'm noticing that outside my street tree looks like that. And so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so now what should I do for that street tree? Well, it depends, like everything, like Billy would say, it depends. Um, that's a common, common thing that happens, uh, especially to tree, street trees, especially to kind of trees um, that were either planted improperly or uh, maybe they were too deep or maybe when they came from the nursery, they were too deep. That's called girdling roots. So what you've got are those roots um, that are circling around. And the problem there, the potential threat, is that they're going to circle around the trunk um, they're going to cut off other roots, um, so they're going to cut off their ability to circulate um, water and nutrients, but then they're also going to circle around the trunk and could, you know, girdle that tree, um, thus the name. Uh, so it depends on the size of the, your tree. Now, if you're talking about a, a new tree, a new tree planting, there's ways that you can set yourself up for success and try to, um, uh, you know, minimize that happening by having a really nice big hole that they can move into, making sure it's planted at the appropriate height. If you find any girdling roots in there, so if you're buying uh, a tree from a nursery, making sure you unpack that and look and try to uh, prevent those roots from, from being there. You could prune them. Um, but if it's a really large tree at that point, it's difficult because you've got to weigh the damage uh, that that would do uh, you know, causing a big wound in the tree uh, to the benefits. Um, so like everything, I'd say it depends. <laughs> yeah, they planted it in 2001, so it's a large tree, so yeah. yeah. So I see we've got a question here. Can you give us any recommendations for a tree suitable uh, as a street tree? 
Um, so there are lots of different options and it kind of depends on, uh, you know, what street tree means in your context. Like, do you have, like I have, if I look out my window, I have a space that's about two feet wide that I could stick a tree in. Um, and of course, there's not going to be many trees that are going to thrive in a tiny, tiny little spot. Um, so in that case, I'd actually just put it in my yard instead of in that narrow little strip. Um, but there's a lot of really hardy trees. I'd always recommend uh, a native species. Um, uh, there's, it, what I do uh, is I'd, and it depends on your area, um, but I would walk around and uh, see kind of what other people are growing with success. Um, and then maybe what's overplanted. So like here in Lexington, Kentucky, we've got some trees that are, you know, grow quite well, but they're all over. So we've got a lot of red maple, we've got a lot of um, willow oak, We've got a lot of um, uh, sycamore and ginkgo and um, other species that are just super, super tolerant of um, those stressful uh, environments, but we've already got a lot of them. Uh, so it's also good to kind of consider, you know, let's say something comes in and we had a lot of ash as street trees. So let's say something comes in and kills off you know, maples like the emerald ash borer did um, with ash. Uh, so you want to have some diversity there too, not just the same species throughout. Um, my shingle oaks are suddenly dying. Is there a common cause for this? Um, you know, I'd, I'd want to see some pictures of that. So why don't you shoot us an email uh, with what you've got. Now there are some insects that can cause foliar issues in shingle oaks. Uh, oaks. Um, there's uh, one insect in particular that can make it look like all the trees are dying, all the leaves are brown, um, but really that's just the insect eating those leaves. Um, at the other side of things, um, I have been seeing a lot of oak tree decline uh, this year. Um, so kind of dying and doing really poorly. And I think that the weather that we've had, these extreme wet years, uh, plus the drought that we've had, um, has really stressed them out. So it's leading to a lot of declines that maybe aren't as um, directly linked to a particular cause. But um, that's what we're here for. So send us some emails and we'll see what we can do. That would be a good so, reminder too. And uh, from the woods today.com, there is a link there that you can actually go to a survey and give us any kind of feedback that you would want to on the show but you can also submit pictures that way and um, you can attach your picture and then we can get it to Ellen and uh, she can tell you hopefully what's wrong with that tree and hopefully it's not something new that we haven't seen before but at least we would uh, know about it in that case so so I'm going to try to unmute Alexandra and uh, see if she's able to join and um, uh, talk with us from the field today in Western Kentucky. Uh, she's doing some, look at her, she's in the woods and she's actually in the woods today, unlike me when I usually have my fake screen up. Hi, Alexandra. Hello, thank you for having me, Ellen and Renee. How are y'all? Great, how are you? Awesome, out in the field. <laughs> Yeah, so you're there surrounded by six sassafras trees, is that correct? Well, we're here in Hopkins today um, at the Jeffers Bend Recreation Area where we have um, one of our sentinel garden plots for the Laurel Wilt Seeds Project with the Southern Research Station, uh, the Federal Forest Service. And uh, at this location, we have actually only found one infected tree. Most of the sassafras here are in so as I mentioned, there is uh, some light at the tunnel sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing to say, you know, uh, while we're talking about the monitoring work and what we're seeing, there are fantastic researchers um, here at UK and across the country that are looking into these things um, and trying to give us some solutions long term. Uh, so Alexandra, I know we've got a little bit of uh, feedback on your end, so I'm going to uh, just she's on the line so if you have other questions um, please chat them and we'll bring her back um, but uh, thanks again for joining uh, us today thank you all for having me before before I go I did want to share uh, so if anybody is wondering how can they get they've got a question and they want to get in touch with Alexandra or someone else um, this kind of map gives you some resources and how to get in touch with her um, with the Division of Forestry, uh, uh, kind of be, they have offices across the state. So if you've got an issue, um, feel free to reach out and, um, uh, you know, they'll be there to um, help and assist. That would be great. 
All right. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions right now about tree health, but uh, tree threats. But if you have any questions at all, make sure to put them in the chat pod and we'll get them answered for you. Um, but we right now I want to move on to our tree of the week. Uh, Lori Thomas is on vacation as well, but she is going to be talking about chestnut oak. And um, so we are going to go and watch that right now. Hi, I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the chestnut oak. Quercus Montana, also known as rock chestnut oak, rock oak, or tan bark oak. It is found in the Appalachian Mountains and surrounding areas. It is a member of the white oak group, but the leaves resemble American chestnut leaves, hence its common name. Chestnut oak is a medium-sized tree that typically grows 50 to 80 feet tall and up to 2 feet in diameter. It's usually found on dry uplands and ridge tops. It is intermediate in shade tolerance and relatively slow growing. Chestnut oak leaves are deciduous, alternately arranged as you can see in the photo on the twig, and simple in form, meaning there's just one blade. They are somewhat oval, narrowing at the top and the bottom of the leaf. The edges of the leaf are scalloped, and the surface is shiny green and pale on the underside of the leaf. Chestnut oak is monoecious, which means one house, like the other oaks, and this means that a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are yellow-green on a two to four inch long catkin and the female flowers are reddish and appear as a single spike. They appear with the leaves in mid-spring, and the flowers are wind-pollinated, and pollination is impacted by weather. A rainy spring can mean reduced pollination. The fruit is an acorn. Chestnut oak acorns are relatively large, one to one and a half inches long. They are somewhat egg-shaped with a thin warty cap that separates from the acorn when it matures. They mature in one growing season, dropping in the fall and germinating once dropped. The acorns are dispersed by gravity and squirrels. Chestnut oak typically begins acorn production around 20 years, and acorn production varies greatly from year to year, with good crops every four to five years. Chestnut oak, like most of our oaks, is an important tree for wildlife. The acorns provide food for a variety of wildlife, including deer, turkey, and chipmunks, and deer also browse the young foliage. According to the National Wildlife Federation, oaks are one of the top 10 trees for wildlife. Oaks serve as a host tree for more than 500 different Lepidopteran larvae, including dagger moths and giant silk moths, as you see in the photo. These larvae, in turn, feed seasonal migratory songbirds, such as the Silurian warbler. The trees also provide critical nesting habitat for many of our cavity nesters, including the white-breasted nuthatch, as well as small mammals and insects, such as bees. The oaks also provide good cover for a variety of mammals as well because the leaves typically persist longer than other plant associates. The bark is smooth and gray on young trees but darkens and becomes deeply furrowed on the older trees as you can see in this photo. The deep furrows make it an easy tree to identify in the woods. The wood is light to medium brown in color though there can be a fair amount of variation in color. It falls into the white oak group and shares many of the same traits as white oak, Quercus alba. Chestnut oak has medium to large pores and a fairly coarse grain. It has been rated as having very good resistance to decay. The wood is often lumped with white oak, Quercus alba, and used for many of the same products, including lumber, flooring, furniture, and railroad ties. The tree can be a nice addition to large landscapes for shade and attracting wildlife as well. The national champion chestnut oak is in Washington, D.C. in Ward 3. It is 276 inches in circumference, 105 feet tall, with a 104 foot crown spread. Kentucky's champion chestnut oak is in Johnson County in, Paints, in the Paintsville Wildlife Management Area. It's 204 inches in circumference, 95 feet tall, with a 182 foot crown spread. 
If you'd like to know more about Champion Trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree National Register or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees to learn about Kentucky's Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about chestnut oak. Chestnut oak bark has the highest tanning content of all the oaks and was commonly used in the tanning process prior to the 20th century, thus one of its common names, tan bark oak. The wood makes excellent firewood due to its high fuel value. The acorns are edible, but must be soaked to remove the bitter tannins prior to eating. They were an important staple in the Native American's diet. The tree's scientific species name, Montana, is Latin for mountain, referring to where the tree grows. Thanks for joining me today to learn about the chestnut oak. I hope you get the opportunity to get out in your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy this outstanding oak. We're going to move on to a special treat that we have. Um, a viewer uh, actually created something for us. Ellen, do you want to uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we had a viewer um, submit a theme song for From the Woods today. Um, so we're going to play that, but also a little bit of interview with uh, that uh, person about, you know, uh, their interest in uh, wood and how it kind of connects to their music. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share that. Well, I've been playing the guitar for a long time, and for quite a few years, I've had this wonderful Martin guitar as a loner. And eventually, the owner, after many years of being kind enough to let me use it, took his guitar back home, and I was left in search of a nice guitar. And I'm a lead AP credited professional. I'm an architect, and yeah, lead AP looks to make buildings more sustainable, and in this case, I look to make a guitar more sustainable. Typically, a guitar or a nice guitar is made with woods like mahogany, rosewood, ebony, tropical woods, which are not necessarily sustainable, in some cases quite rare. And I started looking for a way to make a guitar with woods sourced more locally and sustainably. And uh, I approached a luthier named Ed Gerber, who had made guitars out of cherry before. And he made this nice guitar for me, sourced with mostly Kentucky cherry, and uh, also some walnut and some, some roasted maple. The only part that is not regional wood is this top, which is Sitka spruce from Canada, but it's an all North American uh, regionally or uh, sustainably sourced uh, guitar. So, uh, and I think it sounds really nice. So I'm very pleased with it. The squirrels are reading acorns and the chipmunks play Under the shade of the tall and mighty oak Where you can see what's going on from the woods today From the woods today I love that. And um, we encourage anyone who wants to do something on our show uh, to send us a video. And of course, it has to be about woods now. Don't forget that. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So many thanks and full disclosure. There, there may have been a relative involved in that. Um, a bit. <laughs> but, uh, we would love to see your videos and hear more from you, um, our viewers, about uh, your connection to music and the woods. Um, and we'll be happy to share it uh, here. So um, thanks, thanks for sending us that. Exactly. Well, I think that's all we have for today, Ellen. I greatly appreciate you being uh, my co-host today. Uh, can't do it without you. And so I uh, appreciate you doing that. 
And um, don't forget, always 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, make sure you tune in either via our Zoom or via Facebook Live. You can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and click on the Watch Live button. Um, you'll get into our Zoom meeting or just make sure to like us or share us on uh, Facebook and get video notifications when we go live. And um, we, uh, we'd love to have you a part of it each week. Thanks again and um, see you next week. All right. Thanks all. We appreciate it. See you.